Deixa eu ver. some questions that I want to be answered and I did uh, ask all these people who present their sev various circles to try to answer those questions. Of course, I'm not sure that they would. It's like you are asking your, your students to give you some, some answer and you never know what they will choose to answer instead. So uh, here are the some of the questions that I am interested in. This is the first question. It comes in, well, in so some parts. Uh, it's sort of a description of a circle. It's how long the circle exists and uh, uh, whether sa same students come one year and the next uh, return next year. Uh, what, what, is what is the main goal of the circle? Is it to, to coach students who would participate in various competitions or is it to discuss some interesting topics in, in mathematics or maybe something else? and um, how and to what extent is the circle funded? So this is the first question. Now the second question is uh, recruitment. And it comes in two parts. How and where do you recruit your students? And do you screen or test them beforehand or you let that anybody come and join your circle? And then the second part of this question, how do you recruit weekly session leaders? provided that you do have weekly session leaders, maybe it's just one person or two people who, who run the whole show. And then the third question is retention of the students. Do students come regularly? Do they get or turn in any homework? Are they expected to do so? Uh, do they receive, what is the incentive for the students to continue with the circle besides just pleasure? Do they receive some kind of certificate or award at the end of the program? And then the next question is about materials. What sort of materials are used at or developed in the circle? Do you use web and to what extent? Do you have any coherent year-long uh, curriculum? Do you collect or publish and publish lecture notes and or problem collections? And the last question is, well, is do you think that there is something special or different or unusual about your particular circle? Well, I, I will leave the questions with no, with no details on, on the screen. And then, as I said, uh, every person will choose whatever questions he or she wants to, to address. Uh, our first circle is Salt Lake City Circle. Peter Trapa is going to uh, to tell us about about the circle. Uh, Peter received his PhD in 1998 from MIT. He arrived at the University of Utah in 2001 and became involved in organizing the Utah Mass Circle sh shortly uh, thereafter. His main research interest in is Lee theory. Well, it's uh, it's nice to be here, and I appreciate the invitation from the organizers. Um, so as Tatiana said, I, uh, I arrived in Utah about four years ago, and that was the time that uh, the department had just written a bigger grant that had been funded. Hugo was, of course, still at, at Utah, and Jim Carlson was there too, and they, they had written the math circle into the Vigor grant. And I was chosen as the person to, to be the faculty member who uh, would, would be in charge of it, who would administer it. So. I, I had been in Boston for a number of years. I had worked, in fact, I, uh, with, with high school students. I'd volunteered in some of the high schools. I'd, I'd mentored some RSI kids, or one RSI kid, and, and I was a postdoc at Harvard. But in all that time, I, I, hadn't, um, I hadn't interacted with the, the Boston Math Circle at all, and I had never really taken any contests in my career. So um, I was very poorly prepared for this job. And when you factor in the fact that all four of my grandparents were Americans, I mean, I really was, this was hopeless, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so, so I had no chance from the beginning. <coughs> but what, what Hugo had conceived of, Hugo and Jim, th that it would be a uh, mass circle based loosely on the, the Bay Area of and Svesda and, and Paul's creation here. Um, and, and that was the model that, that, we, that we went for initially. And a lot of our problems 
initially stemmed from this, uh, it can be explained in Fomin's ta taxonomy. I mean, this, this is one of the metropolis areas, and Salt Lake City, Utah is not. We draw on a population of probably about 500,000 people. Um, we don't have the concentration of academics, don't have the concentration of Russians and Eastern Europeans. So uh, the, the there's diff different set of um, different set of issues. And it took us a while to, to, to the, the goal, wha what the bottom line was going to be evolved. Was the bottom line going to be about contest? That's what it was initially about. In the end, each session we'd we decided would be, the, 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 main, the main bottom line was to get kids to understand what it means to understand something. And as you all know, as mathematicians, this is, this is the heart of all mathematical endeavors. And it's the starting point of, of, of moving into to mathematical research, for instance. Uh, we it th and it's, it's hard, y you have to really resist a lot of temptations here. One time, a colleague of mine led the math circle. He gave this beautiful talk about percolation theory of salinated water going through sea ice. There are pictures of polar bears, his trips to the Arctic. The kids were all amped up about math at the end of it. They were really excited. And in some ways, it was a, uh, it was a, great, it was a great math circle, but it, it, didn't, it didn't adhere to the goal that we were after. I mean, I came away, I didn't understand anything in that talk. There was no mathematical content, really. It was a great way to get kids excited about math, but it wasn't, it wasn't what we were after. So, uh, so it took us a long time to, to really realize that, that this, this meta-level understanding is really what we're trying to, to instill in these kids. Um, my, my time is probably running short. I, I have s there's some mechanical issues about recruitment and what a typical session looks like. Um, so, so what? It w so, I'll, I'll leave recruitment aside for just a moment until if I unless I have time at the end. Um, a, a typical session. It's two hours. We meet once a week for two hours. There's a session leader, uh, typically a faculty member. Uh, the session leader leads leads two consecutive weeks to to maintain some sort of continuity. Uh, at the end of, of two blocks of two, so roughly every five weeks, we have a contest loosely based on the last, um, the last two units, the last four weeks. Um, and that model works pretty well. But what, I mean, we, we've seen yesterday, we, s we saw two uh, very successful um, sessions, math circle sessions. And, and you, you for those of you who went to both of those, you, you can see what it takes for this to be a successful enterprise. And there are really two components. You have to have a leader of the session or co-leaders who they're dynamic, they're fun, they're engaging. The kids, uh, the kids get excited. They they can take the circle in unexpected directions. If the kids have interesting ideas that weren't originally anticipated, they have to be mathematically very knowledgeable. That's one component. The other component is the topic they pick has to. Um, the the, to the choice of topic is very important, and we saw the two topics. In some sense, in the in the right hands, adding the numbers from one to a hundred with a group of elementary kids, you're, you're guaranteed that's going to be a home run because that is just such a great topic. And in in the same way that uh, you know tracing tracing graphs <coughs> without lifting your pencil, that that's going to be a great great topic. Now, um, in this latter component to being a good session, this, this these topical matters, that's a that's a way. I mean, Fomin said that these these university based circles, this university model, really can't exist. In, in some isolated setting, there has to be some sort of network to support it, and the network should be or could be in place to to um, you know to you know maybe a web repository for some archive of interesting topics, materials like that. What I usually do, you know, when I lead the session, there's so many commitments on my time that it's usually the night before, and I'm trying to design something. So I pick up one of these books that was for sale, and I and I pick out a topic, or I go online, and I hope that I can steal some notes that you guys have written before. And it, but it's you know the web is is wonderful and terrible. It's all out there, but you can't find it. So, um, <laughs> so, and maybe maybe you can find it, and I'm just ignorant of of, of where it is. But one thing that should come of uh, these couple of days is a few people get together and think intelligently about how how I mean th these are difficult questions, right? How how to how to really organize what's out there in some coherent way. But that that's a that's a tractable goal. The other part, the, the, the getting dynamic leaders who, who know what it's all about and, and are good with the kids and, and the right atmosphere, that is just going to be a problem always because, as you all know, you've hung around math departments long enough to know that math professors, are they're, they're just not selected for the, that set of skills. I mean, there are probably two or three faculty members at any given university who, who can talk to the kids in a way that's meaningful and, and, and get the right atmosphere. Uh, and not surprisingly, those are the ones who are on 
all the committees because you know they're they're the most functional members of the math department. <laughs> they're and it's true, right? I mean, they're the ones whose time is, you know, they have the most successful research programs. They're running their own research seminars. They have lots of collaborators coming in. They're, you know, they're chairs or future chairs. And competing for their time is, is difficult. Um, but hopefully, like, uh, all of you feel a deep responsibility that I if you have the skill set, that you, there you have some responsibility to these kids. And... Um, Remarkably, it turns out that the people with the skill set usually do feel that same responsibility, so it, it, it can work. Um, anyway, so I think I've exhausted my time. I didn't cover all the, uh, I didn't really talk very much about recruitment at all, but um, I'll stop here. I think it's a good place to stop. So. Uh, our next circle is San Diego Mass Circle, and Richard Rasek is running it, and um, I did ask everybody to provide me with a few uh, few sentences about themselves so that I could introduce people. Richard didn't do that, and he knew better. He knew better because he has been introduced by George. Everybody knows now <laughs> what he's doing, so Richard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our, our math circle is, is distinct from the others. I'll, s I'll start with this one because it's the easiest. In that ours was not uh, exactly a high concept. It wasn't an organization that decided to build something. We had no infrastructure. We had really no anything. Um, basically, I, I started thinking about having something in San Diego in around 2001 or 2002, but um, I had no students and I had nowhere to host it, so I didn't get very far. I tried writing people in the area. That didn't work, um, so I, I gradually gave up. Uh, at that time, I was not working. Um, those of you who know me, I, I traded bonds for four years at D.E. Shaw, and some of you probably know some other math Olympiad types that went that route for a while. And I left that looking for something more um, creative and productive to do. And gradually, uh, Harold Ryder brought me back into education, and I very much uh, in, am in his debt for doing so. And I'm trying to achieve my life. But coming here, part of it where I came here was to part partly to achieve my life goal of catching up to Harold in terms of number of people in this community he knows. I figure, you know, if I keep meeting 10 people a day, I'll catch up to them by the time I'm his age. Um, anyway, w so I didn't, I couldn't get started because I didn't have students. I didn't have a location. Uh, and then in April of 2003, I, I coached uh, a student, Michael Viscardi, uh, in this, in the Math Counts program. And he made it onto the California team. And then he became a member of SET. And in San Diego, they tried to build a local SET group. And... That was going to be just for students in San Diego. They had a meeting. They brought in some parents, and they talked about, you know, what are, we, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And at the next meeting, the Viscardis recommended bringing me in. So I went in the room, and there were seven parents and students, and I talked about how important problem solving was to me. And frankly, th this sort of thing, math olympiads, math circles, I didn't have math circles, but math contests is responsible for every single bit of professional success I've ever had. And it's also responsible for many of my closest friends. Sam's around here. Maybe he's not here. He's skipping out on my session. Going to have to get him. But you saw Sam earlier today. You know, he was one of my closest friends in high school. We were in each other's weddings. We met each other at MOP. And I don't keep in touch with anybody I went to high school with, but I keep in touch with the people I competed with. Um, and that's why it was very important to me. So I talked about these things. And three days later, I got a phone call from one of the parents saying that I had set off a series of firecrackers in their household. Their son was really turned on, and this is what he wanted to do. Fortunately, his father was a professor of psychology at UCSD. And I told him, you know, about this, this crazy idea of, you know, having these sessions for kids, and all I needed was the place and the students. So he set, he set me up in the psych department then, and he just gave me a room for three hours on Saturday mornings. And so I would just go there and talk about whatever I felt like talking about. And that, I, I drew things from books that I had. Um, and so most of, as far as my materials is, I just kind of came up with whatever I felt like talking about at the time. And where I got my initial students was the set group. There were, th that room, that first room, there were seven students there. Six of them came to the first meeting and kept coming for, for quite a while. They had friends, and then also the books that I had written uh, when I finished college. Uh, I had mailing lists. All the, I just sent letters to all the people who, from San Diego, there were only four, but all the people from San Diego who had bought the books, because San Diego is not a hotbed of mathematics. And this is why the, the math circle was able to get started. And people were driving from LA, people were driving from up in Irvine, is because we're the only game in town, so they came. 
there's not a math culture in San Diego. And this is something that we have continued to battle with. Uh, so for the first three or four months, um, we ran it this way. It's very, or I should say I ran it that, this way because I was still the only instructor. And we, m we met on every single Saturday. I would talk about something. Um, every other week I would give them a problem set at the end and split them into two groups. And the next time they came to the math circle, we would have a little math contest. I got this idea out of the math circles book that someone was holding up here earlier today. Um, had a little math battle, I think they call it, in that book. And that worked really well. Uh, throughout the summer because the same group of, a group of kids were coming back, were coming back, were coming back. But then we were a little bit of a victim of our own success in that when the school year started, we started having many more kids come. Um, so we grew from this group of 10 or 12 students who were very eager to a group of 24, 20, 28, and many of them were young. There were 6th graders, 7th graders, 8th graders, and they're not doing inversion. They're not doing generating functions. You know, you, we couldn't reach both groups, so we split them. And I had, a second, I had a second person join my company. I'd started a company in the meantime to develop materials for these types of students. We split them and started a young group and an old group. And I think that's the point at which, w when we started to grow, we didn't adapt for that very well. And because we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the students coming every single week. Kids would come some weeks and not others. So we had to disband the giving out a contest and having it the next week because some of the kids couldn't come. This was also partially the school year. The school year made it a lot harder. Uh, we also, frankly, just got tired. I, George mentioned earlier, like, some of these programs are hard to run. We don't have any other instructors. We would occasionally get a parent or a student to come in and talk. And to have us go every single weekend, we're completely unfunded, which is probably another difference between us and, and some of the other circles is this is just, you know, we just decided to get together and do this. The students pay nothing. The only thing they ever have to pay is every once in a while they have to bring refreshments for everybody. Um, so we at least don't have to deal with that. So after we split, we split the group and started having kids coming intermittently, um, we kind of lost some continuity, particularly with the older group. The younger kids are still very into it, but the older kids, when they get into high school, they have a lot of things competing for their time, and they start thinking about college, college applications. And they start realizing that coming to a math circle isn't really going to mean anything to Harvard or MIT. And as part of that, what we're, what we're going to be building this year is a, uh, and we have to bow to this, is we're going to build a San Diego Math League and a San Diego Olympiad at the end of the year uh, modeled on some of the things that we've seen elsewhere. And we hope that will provide, the, that will provide something for the kids who are, they'd rather be doing the math competitions, but debate, if they win a debate trophy, they, they can put that on their application to Harvard. But, you know, if they just come to math circles all the time, they can't put that on their college application. Um, it also, we've also found another problem with our math circle is, is uh, we saw it up here earlier, was, is the homework issue. We certainly don't have the time or the funding or anything to deal with, with homework. Um, the kids, they come to the math circle, they participate, they're having fun, they don't learn a thing because they don't do it on their own. Even if they do it on their own in the room, even if you can create some space, an hour of time there for them to do it, they're really not going to learn them. So this is another thing to go home and do it at home. So this is another thing that math competitions, that, that we're going to adopt some of the structure that you were talking about, and I'll, I want to talk to you more about that later, is having our contest half of it based on what we did in the previous weeks. And that gets the kids, that gives the kids a reason to go home. They take the problem sets that we give them and keep working on them and email us if they have problems. Uh, so that's one thing we're, we're going to change. We, we do now have a foundation umbrella to raise funds, so we're going to be able to raise money to give prizes to the kids, and that'll give them incentives, because this is something that we found is just sitting there and, you know, if you build it, they will come. Yes, some of them will come, but not enough of them, and they won't keep coming, not all of them. The most, the kids with the highest, highest enthusiasm, they're going to come. And we've got kids, like I said, they drive two and a half hours each way to come to our math circle, but um, others won't. Others won't who should, that we really would like to, to see keep coming. Um, I could uh, take a few more minutes. The other, another place we get materials is we, when I was at Shaw, we had a saying which was, good programmers write good code. Great programmers steal good code. <laughs> and that's where we get a lot of our materials. And we'd like to, to thank, thank Peter and thank the, the Berkeley Mass Circle and Tom Davis. We, we, we take plenty of your materials, too. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's for people who would like to start one. That's mainly the thing I would like to leave you with is is you can do it. It's, it's a lot of work, 
and the one main thing I'd stress is don't be over ambitious in the beginning. In the beginning, I thought I could teach it every single weekend forever, and that's just not true. One, one person can't do that, or it takes a far better person than I am, and there are lots of them, but I still doubt if anyone could do it every single weekend. <laughs> uh, have reasonable goals. Have a good structure in place. We're, we're gradually moving towards that, and we've, we've learned an awful lot from our mistakes that way, and I hope to learn a lot by listening to the rest of them. Thank you. The next circle is San Jose Math Circle, and Tom Davis is going to talk about it. Uh, Tom got his PhD from Stanford, then used it for 16 years in silicon graphics, and has been doing mostly fun stuff after he retired from silicon graphics. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, well, we'll see how quickly I can get through this. Uh, basically, I, uh, about six, seven years ago, I went to a talk at MSRI that Zvezda gave where she talked about the idea of starting math circles that is sort of like what we're running in Eastern Europe uh, in the United States, and I thought it was the most fantastic idea I'd heard. And uh, so I live in the South Bay, and so uh, Tatiana and I and some other people s founded the one in San Jose. And uh, so it's been going almost, I guess, maybe exactly as long as the Berkeley Circle, six and a half years now, something like that. Uh, the thing that, w there are a bunch of things that make our circle a little bit unusual. One of them is that about once a month we have another activity that we call BAMA, or Bay Area Mathematical Adventures, uh, which s runs on the same night as the circle. So basically there's three Wednesdays where there's a circle and then one which is a BAMA talk. The BAMA talks are, again, presentations to the same aged kids. Usually a lot more uh, people show up to the BAMA talks, kids and adults. Uh, they're, they're more formal. Uh, they're more formal. Uh, let's see, what else? They're shorter. It's only an hour for the BAMA talks. The circles are close to two hours. Uh, let's see, there's an honorarium, I guess, with the, uh, the BAMA talks and not with the circles. <laughs> and uh, what else? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, w w one of the things that works well in our circle, I think, is, is at least now that we've been running for a while, we have a pretty good stable of, of people to lead the circles. At the very beginning, there were five of us, I think, who did all of the work. I mean, that's a lot better than one person doing the work, <laughs> one or two. But, uh, but even with five people, it was... Uh, 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 quite an effort, and now there we have a, a long list of people, and so uh, it's not not as much pressure. The other nice thing is after you've been running for three years, most of the kids who, who were there in the first year are gone, and so you can start reusing your old material. So, so that's great. <laughs> so it's it's actually uh, uh, quite a bit easier. Um, obviously, uh, and, and also if you have a lot of people who are capable or have volunteered to give talks, you can uh, screen them a little bit. In other words, you find somebody that's really not doing a good job. I mean, you can imagine some. But he's thinking, well, I'm going to, these kids have never heard about group theory, so I'll introduce them to group theory, and we've only got two hours, so I'll probably only get to the CELO theorems. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> I mean, that, I, this is not a huge exaggeration. From <laughs> and they'd never dream about doing this in a college class, right? Uh, anyway, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Um, uh, I love the fact that we have a lot of different people coming in. The kids see a, a, a different point of view. Uh, I mean, I go in and I try and make it clear, look, at this is how the way I think about problems. It may be different from the way the other people have done it. Uh, you know, and, and the great thing is you can see how so-and-so does it, so-and-so does it, and so-and-so does it. You know, I'm very concrete. I like to have lots of uh, little concrete examples before I start working. Other people are more theoretical. Some people think better one way, some the other. I think it's uh, great if the kids see all of that and they can <laughs> see that mathematicians think differently. And I, I try and also, uh, and, and I think a lot of other people, uh, try and show how they think, you know, how they're thinking about problems and so on. Let's see, have I, I haven't really talked about anything except the history here. Uh, <laughs> da -da -da -da. Hmm. Recruitment, yeah. The recruitment of students is, uh, is a nasty problem. I think that should be actually one of the main things that we think about here. You know, how do you go to the high schools? Uh, you know, if you, we have a few high school teachers here, but th they're probably in the top 0.1%, at least in terms of the... Uh, <laughs> their usefulness uh, with respect to recruiting people for math circles. You know, you can't just ma mail letters to the math department of XYZ High School and say, you know, have your teachers send the things in. And for a lot of us who are in university or not in high, at least not in high school, we don't have a lot of context, so it's hard to know how to do that. And I don't know enough about being a high school teacher. You know, are there, are there places that they all go? Are there, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, but yeah, the, the, the correct bars, or I, I don't know what, Me meetings, I mean, uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, because in, in some sense, you're offering them a, a pretty good deal. You say, look, you don't have to do anything. We've got the, the things set up here. We've got people to come in, interesting talks. If you've got good students, just send them to us. That's really, you know, if you've got good students encouraging them to come, that's really all we ask. And, and yet it still seems to be hard to do that. So I would love to have more discussion in general on, on how to do that, how to get into the high schools. Uh, the, the parents are also good. I mean, if, if, especially in the Silicon Valley area where we are, there are a lot of very motivated parents, and, and, and that works well if you can meet the right ones. And, but most of the ones I've met are friends or friends of friends or friends of friends of friends, something like that. Uh, again, there's no easy mechanism for it to find it. And the other trouble is, of course, once the kid uh, graduates from whatever school it is, the, the parents lose interest entirely. It'd be great if you could get a sort of a series of parents, so senior, junior, and sophomore parents are working together. You know, I mean, even just one or two of each, and when the seniors graduate, the, the other two can provide some continuity, but again, that's not great. Um, one one th little special uh, observation I made is I, I think it's a good idea when you run the circles, and I know it's true of ours and it's true of the Berkeley circle, uh, that a bunch of parents come. I mean, a lot of times they have to drive their kid there anyway, and so they might as well wait around and watch the talk. And so it's, uh, it's, it's nice to entertain the parents as well. <laughs> uh, one one uh, technique Zvezda used that I loved in one of her circles that, that works nicely is she got up at the front and she said, look, uh, it's a sort of a, a the, the, the kids in here are at a bunch of different levels. Some of you are uh, going to find what I'm saying impossible to follow. Some of you are going to think it's all trivial. Here's a problem for those of you who don't understand the thing I'm saying, and then here's a slightly harder problem <laughs> for, for all of those who think this is trivial. And so if you toss out little tidbits to the students and the parents, maybe, that, uh, that might encourage the parents to keep coming or at least keep the pressure on their kids. Just an idea. Uh, not sure how I'm doing on time. Oh, we, we, we use the web mostly just for our schedule. Uh, uh, and anybody that provides materials, yeah, I'll put pointers to the materials from the talks and stuff like that. I have materials that I've used in a whole bunch of different uh, math circles, the Berkeley, San Jose, and uh, just other talks to other people. And that's quite well organized, but it's on my homepage. <laughs> and, and if anybody's interested, I can tell you how to find it. What else? Okay. Oh, okay, one, uh, well, that's not really important. I had one other, I wanted to end with one thing that I thought was an incredible uh, comment I heard uh, uh, when I was uh, just entered graduate school and there was a teacher there, Carol DeLue, who was incredibly interested in teaching of undergraduates or, or anyone, and he uh, made this, uh, uh, just a perfect description of how you ought to run a math course or a, any kind of a teaching situation. He said, uh, at the end of the hour, you count up the number of minutes you talked and you give yourself one point for every one of those minutes. For every minute that a student's answering you, you get two points. For every minute that you're arguing with a student, you get five points. And for every minute that the students are arguing with each other, you get 50 points. <laughs> and <laughs> it's real rare that I can get the students to argue, but man, I, <laughs> I love it when I can. Anyway, that's uh, what I've got to say. Uh, the next talk is about... Uh, Alabama circle, and in fact, I just learned uh, today that it, it, w it will be about two circles, not just one. W the, they have in the city of Mobile in Alabama, they have two circles, and uh, Dr. Uh, Prokhorov and Natalia Prokhorov uh, run these two circles, and they will tell us about their circles. And yes, it's, it's exactly that Mobile where they had uh, recently that little entertainment, and it, it was on their behalf, I guess. Thank you. No, it's this side. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my talk, uh, uh, I'll talk about um, two mm, math circles. Uh, Mobile Mathematics Circle was organized in 2000 by Dr. Daniel Flas and Vasily Prokhorov. And from uh, 2002, Dr. Scott Carter, Vasily Prokhorov, and Cornelius Pilin were principal organizer of Mobile Mathematics Circle. 
And in year 2004 and fall, uh, 2003 and fall 2003, I organized a mathematics circle at Alabama School of Math and Science. Uh, from the beginning, funding has been provided by the Alabama Space Grant Consortium, this for mobile mathematics circle, uh, University of South Alabama Foundation, and Department of Mathematics and Statistics at University of South Alabama. And from uh, fall 2003 by Alabama School of Mathematics and Science. Uh, goals of our circles to increase knowledge and uh, understanding students in mathematics to help students develop uh, crea uh, creative thinking and problem solving skills, stimulate interest in mathematics and help prepare students for future study of mathematics, offer guidance from working mathematicians and educate students regarding careers in mathematics and science. Uh, problem solving topics for, uh, for our circles, invariance, physical principle, logical problems, games, graphs, induction, combinatorics. Uh, number theory, inequalities, optimization problems, geometry sets, topology, mathematics on voting, and we consider selected problems from Manhattan and uh, Mobile Mathematics uh, Olympiads and from Mandelblot competitions. Uh, in 2002-2004, uh, 11, uh, 11 meetings of circle were chaired by uh, distinguished visitors. We had very good lecture by Dr. Dan Shapira from Ohio State University, uh, Arnold Ross Young Scholars Program, uh, excellent lecture by Tito Andriescu, Pantelimon Stanica, uh, Dr. Philip Kutsko on Chinese uh, um, Reminder Theory. We had Eddie Chiang uh, from Oakland University, Rezvan Gelka from Texas Tech, Dr. John Albrey, uh, uh, York Feldwitz from Germany, excellent lecture by Dr. Arkady Weintraub from University of Oregon. Lectures from, um, uh, by uh, Dr. Loomis and Dr. Uh, Joseph Pshitutsky. Uh, uh, some details. Mobile Mathematics Circle meets every Monday evening from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. from mid-September through April. And in first year, uh, we had uh, 26 sessions, uh, in second 24, in uh, third 26, in 2003-2004 25 s sessions, uh, with a uh, total of 79 students in first year. 59 in second, 64 in third, and in year 2003-2004 we had 144 students. In fall 2004 we had 12 sessions uh, with 50 students from 15 uh, different local high schools. And we have between 15 and 25 students come to us every Monday. I'd like to mention that uh, this activity, this program, Mobile Mathematics Circles, uh, Circle, very well supported uh, um, by University of South Alabama. Uh, in December 2001, Dean of Art and Science at University of South Alabama, uh, Alabama ranked the Mobile Math Circle among the college highlights of the year. Uh, 
Organizers of Mobile Mathematics Circle assisted by some faculty from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics uh, from University of South Alabama, Dr. Kalektionova, uh, Gillette, Kalinin, Zang, and uh, by high, schools, uh, high, school uh, high school teacher, uh, uh, Mr. Mike Fletcher. Uh, very often undergraduate students come to my circle and undergraduate student Katrina Wooten presented talk on Venn diagram. Occasionally we see uh, some parents. Alabama uh, School of Math and Science, Math Circle meet every Monday uh, uh, from mid-September through, through May. And um, in first year, we had 23 sessions with 36 students. And uh, this fall, 11 sessions with 22 students. Approximately 10 to 15 of students regulars. Uh, in addition uh, to my circle, I'm running problem-solving seminar. Uh, goal of this um, problem-solving seminar to prepare students uh, for various competition and additional topics covered, uh, selected problem from Mandelblot competition and American mathematical competition, polynomial series, uh, sequences in series, and equations. Uh, about recruitment. Uh, over summer, letters sent, uh, sent to mathematics uh, almost all, all mathematics teachers from Mobile County. Uh, posters printed and distributed in, in local schools. Uh, organizers very often visit uh, local, school, local schools to attract more students to Mobile Mathematics Circle. Uh, in fall 2003, Dr. Scott Carter was interviewed uh, by the local TV news station about Mobile Mathematics Circle. Uh, six articles on Mobile Math Circle uh, were published in University of South Alabama Midweek Memo. Article Mobile Circle of Change uh, was published in Mobile Register, local newspaper. Article Mobile Circle, uh, the Mobile Mass Circle by Flas and Proche uh, was published in Alabama School of Mass and Science, uh, Alabama Journal of Mathematics in fall 2000, uh, 2002. But preparation, uh, we uh, used uh, various books. Uh, I'd like to mention the most favorite books that we use. Uh, this uh, mathematics circles by uh, Fomin Genkin Ittenberg, Problem Solving Strategies by Engel, Art of Problem Solving, Art and Craft of Problem Solving by Paul Zeitz, Mathematics, uh, uh, mathematical Olympiad by Andreescu and Feng. And um, it's not possible to, um, to just mention all the books that we use and like. Uh, uh, a couple words about my Bill Mass Olympiad. Uh, the first Mobile Mass Olympiad opened to all high school students um, uh, was uh, in uh, spring 2001. Olympiad was held for the purpose to give math students uh, opportunity to try out the newly developed problem solving skills and uh, of selecting two students to participate in Kansas State University Mathematics Olympiad. Uh, you can see we had winners from various schools, Alabama School of Math and Science, Alma Bryant, U.S. Wright, uh, Davidson, and some of these students won uh, um, Kansas State Mathematics Olympiad. And I'd like to mention last year winners of Mobile Math Olympiad, all three student won uh, first, second, and third prize on Kansas State University Mathematics Olympiad. 
and uh, just a couple words about uh, plants. Uh, about future plants. Organizers plan to organize South Alabama Mathematics Olympiad to be held on campus of University of South Alabama. And uh, once Mobile Mathematics uh, Olympiad is better known, uh, organizers plan to add middle school level to competition. Mobile Math Circle has website www.southalabama.mass.dat. Thank you. Last presenters will be Bob and Ellen Kaplan. Please. We have to share just one. <laughs> the, the twins are there. <laughs> We're very good at taking turns. <laughs> um, our math circle started on a misunderstanding of a model. We were talking to Andre Zelovinsky about the math circles that he had been in in um, the Soviet Union. And we thought of them as groups of people talking about mathematics. Uh, we missed the whole competition uh, concept, which never got mentioned in our conversation. So ours is a math circle the way you might have a reading circle. Uh, someone wrote an article about us which was titled, Two Plus Two Equals Four, Discuss. And I think that's a, a very good description of the way we tend to operate. A couple of technical details, because there were technical questions. Um, we never advertise. We're flooded with students. If we were to advertise, we wouldn't know how to handle them. We have 130 students this semester, uh, which is about average. Our uh, fellow leaders are in this room, Jim Tanton, Mira Bernstein, Dan Zaharopol, fantastic leaders, uh, far better than we are. Uh, Jim was, was teaching with us when he had his PhD, Mira, while she was getting hers, Dan, as an undergraduate at MIT. We look for our teachers, leaders, really, because we try not to say anything to the students. Um, we certainly don't teach them, they teach us. Uh, we look for them among Harvard uh, or MIT uh, undergraduates or graduates. Um, we also, those of you who picked up that handout we gave out yesterday, are now taking our leaders from um, students in the math circle. Sam Lichtenstein, <coughs> who wrote that uh, four or five page handout, is 18. He joined us when he was 10 as a weekday student, is now a student in our older Sunday sessions, and is teaching uh, on weekdays. Um, began by teaching a course on continued fractions. Um, we're now thinking of doing something quite radical. The trouble with mathematicians, as, as you all know, is that they know their stuff, but can't uh, believe that other people don't know it too. That you, you're all so modest. You know, <laughs> how could someone not know what I know? And so we're, we're thinking of trying humanists, people who weren't brought up with the mathematics, retooling them in a particular topic, say equidecomposability of polygonal figures, and seeing how that works. Someone who actually understands that students may not uh, know or even love mathematics. Our students come from everywhere. We have absolutely no entrance requirements, except for one. We try to schedule the classes at difficult times. So for the young, from four and a half, well, actually three and a half is our youngest student now, to 13, late on a weekday afternoon after their school day is over. For adolescents, the answer is Sunday mornings, <laughs> <laughs> from nine to 12. Uh, otherwise, whoever comes, is that's great with us. People who love math and know some of it, sitting next to those, like yesterday, who are afraid of it. Uh, Elena saying yesterday, I'm sorry, I don't get any of this. That's the key sentence. People who are shameless. People who are willing to say, I just don't get it. Someone else saying, well, what about trying this? And then the conversation begins, as it did yesterday. Well, I liked what Eli said. Well, what about this? But Ben said, so it's among them we act as their secretaries. We disappear, I hope, as their secretaries at the blackboard. Uh, funding. We do charge. We charge $225 per student for a 10 one-hour session in a semester. Those are the weekday classes. $450 for the three-hour Sunday sessions. We have a large scholarship program. Whoever needs a scholarship, we give them what they ask for. In this way, we can pay our uh, leaders $1,000 per course. The parents have been extremely generous in donations. The donations of $25 from a from parents who can barely afford it are much more 
touching than a donation of, of $10,000 from someone who has that to spend. Um, I've been saying too much. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons that we don't go in for competitions is that my feeling about mathematics has always been that it itself offers all the challenge that you could possibly be looking for. That it is the problem itself which challenges, it is the problem itself which rewards, it's the problem itself which leads you into seeing how mathematics connects with other ideas. And so what we're looking for is students interacting with mathematics, not students interacting with other students in a competitive way or students interacting with teachers as trying to please them, but people really coming to terms with that which goes on in the privacy of every mathematician's mind, which is thinking, imagining that abstract imagination which doesn't say, gotcha. Um, we have at this point a mother in the math circle who has not yet caught on to this idea. And every time her tiny little son in the front says something interesting, she rushes up to the front and gives him high fives. <laughs> and that's not our idea <laughs> of what you do in the privacy of your own head. So that who was the Italian mathematician who used to walk oh, yes. through a triumphal arch every time he proved a theorem? He built a triumphal arch in his fifth floor apartment in Rome, at which he would, he would crown himself with a laurel wreath and walk through it uh, after having proved a significant theorem. It happened three times in his life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> built a triumphal arch for those three occasions? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> materials. Uh, where do we get our materials from? One idea per course. For four and a half year olds, are there numbers between numbers? It's the one thing we say at the beginning of the course, and they take it from there. What do you mean by that? I don't know, what do you mean by that? Uh, they will devise fractions, try to compare them, getting it wrong nine times out of 10, which is the way it is in mathematics. A third is clearly bigger than a half because three is bigger than two. Um, Sometimes we get uh, topics asked of us. Uh, a 10 year old boy, probably 11 year old boy came up to me once and said, what is I to the I? I've got to know, there's a boy in my school who knows and he won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> and by one of those wonders, an angel put his finger on my lips and I didn't say anything and I said, well, that's a good question. That's really interesting. And it happened to be the end of the fall term and I went home and worked like crazy over Christmas vacation. And got a kind of a framework in which we could go through, starting from the definition of what is a complex number, because there were plenty of people to whom I to the I sounded like total nonsense. Um, by way of Maclaurin series, I say Maclaurin now that I spend my summers in Scotland as opposed <laughs> to Taylor series, which is the incorrect term. <laughs> uh, and we did, you know, trigonometry and we get to e to the i pi 15 minutes before the end of the 10th class and then it just goes beautifully down the Jacob's ladder of falling pieces of wood and everybody said that's incredible <laughs> and then one boy said well what would i to the minus i be <laughs> and so that was our our curtain <laughs> line just the way uh, this thing brings up the question of homework and uh, communication online, um, the way Ben, sitting there yesterday, said when he saw that the n minus first plus nth triangular number add up to the nth square number, he said, cool. And then we went on to pentagonal numbers, leave every session with an open question. That's the homework. And they'll email us or call us or call or email one another over the week in between classes uh, and come into the next class fired up with their ideas, their correct, they're usually incorrect conjectures. Incorrect conjectures are so much more interesting than, than correct ones, aren't they? Um, have we answered all the questions? H have you questions to ask us? Well, we'll be around upstairs <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> Thanks very much. We're doing very well with time here. Any questions to any of the panelists?
Yes. Um, yes, uh, the Kaplans have had uh, a wonderful uh, success uh, and a great technique for um, in helping to uh, helping very young kids. Uh, have you considered pushing it even further? I have long felt that the window of opportunity of the first three years of life, which is usually thought of as a time when we have a special opportunity for learning natural languages, is not properly appreciated. I have felt that what it really is, is the time when we have a special opportunity to learn modes of thought, ways of proceeding so that we can be native speakers of everything from compassion to general exploring skills. And I think that the people in this room are people who could contribute more than anyone else I know of to helping to find a way, perhaps through the web and through each other and through the kind of network that was uh, mentioned earlier, um, to facilitate that. And I think the kind of sense of beauty and taste that Lawrence brought up can best be developed through that also. What ideas do you have on that? Uh, we, since our students begin, as you pointed out, much too old, three and a half, uh, and go on to in their 70s, our, our criterion has always been continence. <laughs> but I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think you're right. We, we really should go. Uh, it's a matter of having a conversation. And uh, two and a half year olds have a wonderful babbles within an envelope of sense. There's, there's that uh, wave of sound. Um, harder for them to um, get their ideas across to one another. I think that's where parents come in, talking in an encouraging way to their children and then bringing them at an age, at the age of reason, which is roughly three, I guess, uh, in, into a forum where they know, all right, so younger, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I don't know how to have a good conversation with five, five two-year-olds. Um, one, yes. By the way, I should have said that uh, in spreading materials, <coughs> um, we have published a couple of books, the, the Art of the Infinite, which you've seen, and Oxford is gonna be publishing our book on the math circle, Out of the Labyrinth, Mathematics Set Free, uh, this coming year which does have some of our course material in it, but course material, what is course material when you don't know what's going to happen at each session? What happens the next time is within the framework of the overall question, what happens if you add vanishing points to the Euclidean plane is a good question to begin a semester. But you can't impose a format, a method on a class. It depends on the problem, it depends on the personalities of the people there. Well, that went beyond answering your question. Um, some of you addressed the question of funding, but I want uh, some more concrete data and ideas. In particular, um, I have met um, resistance from the mathematical community when, um, from certain parts of the community, when I requested uh, initially f uh, trying to find money f to pay the um, as honorarium for um, the lectures for the circles. Um, and also to pay um, some money as compensation for those who organize the circles. Uh, because it takes, as you all of you know, an uh, incredible amount of time. Now, some of you have uh, resolved this problem by um, asking a student fee and parents' donations, and some of you have uh, tried to get funds through the universities. Um, can you describe to us more precisely how much money does this involve? How long did it take you to get it? And who provided the money? <coughs> if it was not the students or parents. I can answer this question about 
our own San Jose Mass Circle, we have no money, no budget, nothing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted to add one comment. Uh, uh, at, at one point, some parent, some executive or something, called and said, "I have a you know a brilliant kid. I uh, want to send him to your math circle. Uh, it sounds like exactly the right thing for him. How much does it cost?" And Tatiana said, "Nothing." And at that point, he said, "Well, it can't be worth anything, so I won't send my kid." So maybe we should have special executive math circles <laughs> for <coughs> you know Silicon Valley chil uh, yeah, brilliant children of Silicon Valley executives. Just an idea. Well, uh, I, I mentioned that there's it's funded partially by this Vigor grant that we have. So the, w the, way, th um, the way that that works is that uh, a typical session has a leader, and then it's thrown open. There's a, l a lot of conversation, a lot of problem solving going on during the session. And they have a bunch of facilitators in the audience, usually two or three graduate students and a postdoc. And these are Vigor postdocs and Vigor graduate students, so they're th their time is th – they're committed to do this. Uh, I get a teaching reduction counts as one class, that, that uh, all the materials uh, are paid for by the department, all the letters we send to the high school teachers. We don't have this problem about, uh, we, we don't charge anything, uh, uh, but we avoid this problem that Tom was alluding to because we, we require that they submit this application that has a letter of recommendation and then we, we say that we review all these applications very carefully and then we send them this letter of acceptance that and they, they feel really good about, they, they beat out. 80% of the students who applied this very selective, but of course we accept everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Hello. I present my business medical circle. My name is Dr. Prokhorov. So mm, we, we have money, okay? So we have, from the beginning, we have uh, supported by Alabama Space Council Consortium. We applied for grant. And they supported ev every year. We need to reapply, but all every year they sup uh, support us. Okay, so it's about five thousand dollars from the point of not with no money. And last year we get some letter from uh, Alabama Space Grants Consortium that how it's possible to get this good program, excellent program for so small money. But it's actually it's enough for us. So and also we use uh, we have uh, average about three thousand dollars every year from Department of Mathematics it's from different sources or from uh, University of South Alabama Foundation. So total about $8,000, and we use this money in different ways. So one of the way is <coughs> we support uh, visit of our students in different places from different Olympiads. So Natalia mentioned we, uh, some of the our winners of our Olympiad visit some, uh, for example, Kansas State Olympiad. We pay for these two, three students visit of this Olympiad, they take part in this Olympiad. Also we so uh, buying books for students every spring, for Winners Olympiad, for students for Pursuit Olympiad. And another source is, another possibility to spend money is we, we invite speakers for our talk. We are trying to select very careful who will present our talks and, and we, uh, we pay for this visit with some small honorarium. And uh, what else? <coughs> well, uh, also we are trying to do, uh, to organize some small library for our department. Also we select some books for departments. We, we pay, uh, some we buy some lunch, uh, we buy some snacks and food and for each mathematical circle. So, and this program is free for high school students, okay, and everybody is welcome. And um, I think 8,000 is probably enough for us. Any other questions? Yeah. I was intrigued by the student who asked the question about eye to the eye. And I was wondering um, how you, do you have to cut off the next step if uh, that could lead you to the Gelfand Schneider theorem, you know, the one of the hills. Hill Hilbert's problem, and of course, i to the minus 2i, and then transcendental uh, numbers and algebraic numbers. Can you go that far with your students? We go as far as the conversation is still general. So, um, th this is why our instructors have to be people whose mathematical knowledge is very deep because a child can perfectly well leap across years of thought and say, I wonder about this. And 
you have to have the mathematical honesty to say, I haven't a clue, but by next week I'll see what I can find out and, and bring in. So uh, one gets a sense before starting a course of where one would like it to go. But uh, the, the metaphor that we use all too often is that we are the Sherpas. We are the people who carry the supplies up the mountain. The people who decide where we're going to go and the direction of the paths will be the students. And sometimes, of course, we say, <laughs> this is probably a crevasse. Maybe we should go in another direction. <laughs> uh, and the Sherpas have to know the mountain extremely well. You can't just say, I'll put the load on my back and you go off. But I must say, I've never had a course end where I thought it was going to end. It's, uh, and frequently, I've learned a lot more than I thought I was going to. <laughs> I have a question, I think, more for the Kaplans. Um, I've been involved teaching mathematics to graduate students down to second graders in Project Seed. In first graders, I had to bail. It was too hard. What do you do with four-year-olds? What topics do you cover? What, if you could say something about that. The thing is always to begin with an accessible mystery, something which will mean something but not a great deal to them and will catch their imagination. Are there numbers between numbers? When I said that to the four-year-olds that I had this, this fall on the first day, it was the first thing I said when they walked into the room, <laughs> a, a little girl said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, you know, you're right, I don't either. And drew a line on the board, put a zero at one end and a one at the other, and said, is there anything in there? And a second girl hopped up and down and said, no, 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 there's nothing in there at all, except, of course, for one half. <laughs> <laughs> she was four and a half. <coughs> so I, I made a mark very near the zero and labeled it one half and said, oh, this. At which point, a third person, a boy, said, it doesn't go there. And I said, oh, yes, it does. I just put it there. He said, it doesn't go there. Teach them to disrespect authority. And uh, so I said, well, where does it go? It goes in the middle. Why, said I, because that's what one half means. Oh, okay, move <laughs> it to the middle. I very reluctantly erased my first one half, put it in the middle, and then I said, is there anything else in there? And then, then came the teacher's nightmare, utter silence. You know, 10, 15, 20 seconds, not a word. A boy at the back of the room began putting on his coat because clearly the course was over. We'd found <laughs> the one number between zero and one. So I started drawing a palm tree, because I can't draw camels. I, I drew a palm tree between the one half and the one. I said, I guess it's just a desert, isn't it? Uh, with palm trees and camels. And the first girl, who will clearly be on the Supreme Court someday, said, you can't do that. Why not? It's not that sort of thing. <coughs> Now, that, that's, that's a tremendous insight for anyone, much less a <laughs> four-and-a-half-year-old. The number line is not that sort of thing. Well, in the course of the ten weeks, they, as I said before, developed fractions with their own weird notation, though ours is pretty weird if you come to think about it, uh, comparing them, finding common denominators, which is you know, where the boat leaves the ship for many people for life in mathematics, arguing about this. Um, is there something you can do with a half and a third to add them, much less compare them. This was a long session, and those sessions ended with open questions. The first time it came up, about a half and a third, the class ended in despair. They went off home, and I thought none of them would come back the next week. When they came back, one little girl said, draw two pies on the board. So I thought, her parents have told her. This is a great problem with math circle students in general, and the very young in particular. So I drew two circles. I said, now draw a line down the middle of one and draw the Mercedes sign in the other. So I, I thought I knew what was coming. She said, now, if it's a pie you like, one half is bigger. But if it's a pie you don't like, <laughs> <laughs> that's called taste in mathematics. So uh, <laughs> another possible topic is what we were doing at the end of yesterday, visual uh, figure at numbers, because they can see these uh, piles of cannonballs. And, and not to have prefaced it with, with the very young, with the um, uh, arithmetic series with, with numbers, but just do it with shapes. Um, geometric problems. Map coloring. Two coloring with maps with straight lines only. Uh, it's amazing how quickly they will take this in their hands and, and run with it. I've, again, talked too much. <laughs> Any more questions? 
Just wonder if you could say a few words about successes and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, efforts that didn't work out so well and getting a diverse group of students into your math circles. Uh, I'd like to start answering, if I may. Uh, in our circle, we, al we always hope that we would be able to attract many different students from many different schools in the area It was the idea that these kids quite often feel very isolated in their own schools. There are not enough uh, like-minded people in their own schools, and we thought that when we provide the opportunity for these kids to bond, they will. It has never happened. I don't know why. I, uh, they just come with, and they talk with their friends that ha they already knew, know from their own schools, and when they part, they just part. And that's one of the failures, and th this is one of the things that I'd like to know from other people, how they uh, do with that and whether they have any success with that. I think we have more luck with getting a, a wide range of students because of taking younger children. I think by the time you, you're talking to high school students, they are very set in their ways and they n know the people they know and they're, they're, they're clannish. Uh, but little kids are far freer in talking to people that they've never seen before. And we do get lots of friendships forming of people from different schools, and then they continue together. Uh, we get a lot of people, <coughs> Cambridge is a, a city of diversity, like this area. You, know, you can get lots and lots of different <coughs> sorts of people. Uh, and the schools are not neighborhood schools. They're all open entry schools. And so people have lots of different friends. And somebody will go to the math circle and then go back to class and talk about what he did and then will come the next term with four or five friends. So I think young is a good way of uh, starting. And I think young is a good way of starting math in general. For us, it's been most successful is when we've had social functions outside of the math circle. So we haven't we haven't done as much of that recently as we should, and we see the effect. The math circle is getting smaller. When uh, when we first started for the first six months, roughly once a month, uh, one of the parents or I would host the students at the at our house and just we'd play games, go swimming in the pool. It was supposed to end at five. Everyone goes home at nine. And that kept the group together much more than, you know, since then school started, things have just kind of spread out, and it hasn't been as effective. But I'd say as, as far as getting people from very different backgrounds or different ages to start really interacting, uh, when we rely just in the classroom, it doesn't work that well. But when we, when we add social functions or let them play games with each other and get them out of the classroom, then it, then it starts to work really well. I might just add a little bit of about recruiting in general. So... Uh, I find that, you know, okay, so we do kind of these traditional things, send letters to all these high schools and get, uh, send applications and s send um, letters to, to kids who scored well on standardized tests. But it also helps to uh, put, put a little, make it a little bit more personal. So I've begun going into some of the high schools, making little presentations about what Math Circle is about. Um, our record with minorities is terrible. Um, Salt Lake City is not as homogeneous as you think. It, it's sort of uh, one half of the city is all white and the other half of the city is all Hispanic. Uh, so. Uh, so I've been going more in, in, into those other um, his, um, traditionally Hispanic schools and talking to kids. And that seems to help. When I do get a minority kid showing up and then he stops showing up, then I start calling, you know, making call, talk to his parents, make sure he comes back. Helps. Um, but putting this personal face on things helps. Sometimes it's embarrassing. I, uh, I they have the state math contest for high school kids. It's a, it's a multiple choice test. And uh, one year I gave out the awards, the, the, high, the prizes. So their parents, tons of high school kids, their parents, I s and I recognized one kid from the math circle who actually won the whole thing. So I went up and I, I thought this would be a nice opportunity for me to introduce myself to his parents. So, so I introduced myself to his parents. I said, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure knowing Morgan. He's, he's a great kid. He's really smart. He's fun to be around. And after all that, his mother turned to me and said, now what grade are you in? <laughs> 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 Any any questions out there? No questions? Oh. Oh, there is a question there. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
kind of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was just looking at the uh, at the schedule, and it seems like this is a good, the last opportunity probably to make some kind of a general comment about meth circle enthusiasts and the problems. And I, I wanted to say this uh, thing about the complaints that we all heard, not necessarily during this session, also, although I heard one or two then, uh, about the problems, you know, that, that we're all having with the quality of education, you know, the problems with the, uh, with the kids and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wanted to, uh, to say a couple of words that drawing on my personal experience, you know, in the end of the 80s, for example, in St. Petersburg, uh, teachers, you, you would hear stories from teachers all the time, unhappy with what kids knew about, you know, mathematics and how bad they were. Then, uh, teachers who were supposed to teach the teachers of mathematics, those, this, another organization, you know, for enhancements, this kind of thing, uh, they would be enraged at the quality of the knowledge of teachers of mathematics. That they, they were supposed to teach them mathematics and, you know, they would say, no, those teachers don't know anything, how are they supposed to teach the kids? And then at the next level, the professors at the university, the faculty of mathematics of my St. Petersburg State University, would be telling horror stories, you know, about how bad the uh, the students were, you know, the 18, 19 year olds that would come to them. And this is one of the used to be one of the best universities in Europe, you know, like 300 best kids from the entire region, you know. All those horror stories. At the same time, St. Petersburg had, say, 30 or 40 math circles. Some of them with 30 kids, some of them with 10 kids, you know, going strong, extremely strong Olympic system. In those years, St. Petersburg would have three or four kids on the IMO team out of six, which is, you know, considering its size, in terms of the entire, you know, compared to the size of the entire S Soviet Union population. That was quite a feat. So what I'm saying is that there is no perfection. I mean, th 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 we also will, we, we always will be complaining. You know, there will al always be gripes about this kind of stuff. A and it's good. It's good to be unsatisfied. I mean, there is no way we, we ever could be satisfied. You know, because it, it ain't happening. You know, it's not going to happen. Never. So, and it's good. And as long as you like what you're doing, as long as the kids are happy and getting some, no, and, and you're getting some satisfaction out of it, you know, then we should keep going. You know, and kids and we all together getting there. But never, <coughs> never quite getting there, you know. It's no perfection, so... That's that's the speed. Your point is that the math circles are making everybody else think bad. Mm. <laughs> oh, you mean comparing to uh, to the uh, to the to the school system? No, 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 no. I was just uh, I was just making a point that the situation was really not that bad. It was really compared to the other places. It was really quite okay on on the top, at least you know, but. On average, or in the bottom of it, of course, there, there will always be complaints and unsatisfaction, and that is good, you know. And even at the top, even in the university, you know, they would, you know, well, I'm repeating myself, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, I made my point. It's just, thank you. Here's another question. I'd last like to ask the panel, um, have you prior to today have any had any discussions with each other um, about sharing examples or, or uh, techniques, and also if you can think of uh, what what might help uh, support that in light of the 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 aim of this conference. Anybody from the panel?
I, I haven't directly corresponded with any of them about, about math circles, but we certainly, uh, one of our instructors knows Peter, Dave Patrick, who works with me, has used some of Peter's materials in his math circles, and I've used some of Tom's. Um, and that's, that's really been the extent of, of how I've interacted with them. But I think it would be great for somewhere for there to be a central repository where, where we could put all these things, or at least links to all these things. Um, I think we've kind of informally done it just by linking to each other's pages. I, you know, if there would be a somebody, not me, <laughs> I'm doing too much, but they could put together some sort of package. So you want to start a math circle. Um, that would be fantastic. I would like to hear anybody else's recommendation for how to do that. That that really would be great if we c if we could make some sort of a central place where to look for materials. And one of the things that we can put there are books. It's the same idea that Google has to to put libraries on the web. And how about putting some some books on the web for for all students everywhere to be able to get them. There is a question there. It's hard to get there. Uh, this is just sort of a point of information about the last uh, the last comment. Um, the MAA is uh, expecting to start a special interest group at this uh, January meeting for um, MAA members who are with an interest in teaching uh, advanced high school mathematics. And that might be uh, a place, part of that is going to be um, students who take calculus and then take a difference equations course or linear algebra or other sort of university level mathematics, but while they're, while they're in high school. But the contest and contest problems and, and contest students is also going to be a part of that group's interest. Uh, I'm um, on the executive committee of the, of the Sigma, so this may be something, if you have ideas, uh, that the Sigma might be able to Im be involved in and perhaps be some central location where some of these, these uh, issues can be discussed and shared. Oh. Of course, I, I just have to say in view of the last question that uh, that's why MSRI is holding this conference. What we hope to come out of this is exactly a central website where we will all contribute uh, what uh, materials that are being generated out of uh, our math circles and we will be able to share those things and we will also have a little primer math circles for dummies or whatever you want to call it um, and um, and if anybody now I've heard lots of people say what a great idea but boy am I overloaded with work and it, it certainly is true we all are but if there's anybody who's looking for something to do <laughs> <laughs> and is really interested in uh, coordinating this activity um, why don't you let me know oh Zesta just volunteered thank you very <laughs> Actually, Hugo, you don't know what I want to say. Since you're there on the stand, I had a question for you, and I, I wanted to ask you during the previous session, but we ran uh, way over time then. So um, one um, person, a woman, asked me today, she wants to organize a math circle. Where uh, does she apply for money, for funding? <laughs> so um, that's a question to you. And secondly, um, I have been lobbying for this and quite successfully for the last several years with the MSRI that the people who are organizing the math circles have to be, re mm, what do you call it, compensated. Yeah, let's call it compensated. And uh, we have come probably to the same understanding as Peter just mentioned with the VIGA grant that organizing a uh, mass circle throughout the year, and I'm not talking about just giving the lectures yourself, but organizing it and coordinating it is probably worth of one uh, university college course. Whether you want to call it one semester, one year depends on how many sessions, whether you have uh, you know, middle school or high school. 
um, both both circles. So uh, if you don't want to overload yourself, you may want to apply for a grant and therefore get one course exemption from the university. And so where do they apply for such a funding, Hugo? Uh, Mark. <laughs> 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 no, ac actually, I, I think there are lots of funding organizations that are interested in this, and I would like to be able to say, in fact, I can say it because it's true that MSRI does have a grant to provide seed money for exactly that kind of thing. Uh, what we need to do is to get this organized and to see how to do it in a sensible and uh, sensible way. So to develop a protocol for doing that. And I think that we will be able to generate other funds to continue that. And uh, I think there are things that the NSF would be interested in participating in, but also other, other foundations like that. So right now we have a teeny little bit of money to help with that, and we're hoping that there's going to be more. I shouldn't have said teeny. We, we have a, a – depends on what you mean by teeny. We, we have enough to get started. Yeah, I, I think we, we really need some sort of a central website where, you know, like at MSRI, where people can find out materials for math circles. But we also ought to give a great deal of thought uh, about how to publicize this so that people will know to go there. You know, go to any other website you can think of that might be vaguely related and make sure they get a pointer to the MSRI site, things like that. Just It's obvious, but if you just have a great website, it's not going to do you much good. Well, I, I, I had been thinking about advertising in various places like Math Horizons. I don't know if Jim Tanton is around here. He can advise me whether or not that makes sense. But those kinds of materials that do go to the high schools, as well as locally, too. I mean, that, that could be done as well. Well, a What what exists now are uh, is the uh, website for the Berkeley Math Circle and also for the Boston Math Circle. They are linked together. The Utah Math Circle in San Jose have uh, websites as well. What we don't have is a central page which goes to the, those places, but I'm hoping that we can get that up within the next few months as, as the first evidence that something has come out of this uh, this meeting. Yes. Uh, in fact, that is why I sent out that sheet for contact information for people who are not registered. And I just talked to my assistant, Rondi, and she's hoping that, on that next week she will be able to email everybody a list of all the participants and their con contact information. I'm also about to pass out uh, some of uh, these, these pieces of paper asking for feedback. In particular, on this issue, I think that would be very interesting. Any ideas that you have, but also feedback, positive and negative, about this uh, this workshop. Thanks. Uh, let me give this back to Tatiana. Yes, our time is, is up. Actually, well, I'll try to take care of it. Uh, there was one question and then you. Yeah. Oh well, um, this um, this is for Hugo. Um, uh, thinking. I know how much work it takes to make a conference like this, and I can't be here tomorrow, unfortunately, but it'd be great if another, a similar one were held a year from now, two years from now, in other words, not make it just be a one-shot thing to further the goals of the conference. That's all. Well, again, uh, you know, we have uh, two funders for this conference. One is the Akamai Foundation, the other is the National Science Foundation. And I know uh, that Tom Layton has very strong interest in these activities, and it is possible that the uh, Akamai Foundation would be willing to fund a sequel. Uh, when I get these responses uh, back from you, I will know whether or not I can go to uh, the National Science Foundation for a similar request. But we would like to do it, yeah. No, no. Listen, by the way, that was not an indication that you got to say, honest, <laughs> be honest, please. <laughs> please. I, I, I take that back. <laughs> <coughs>
I'd like to make some small comment about books. So we use different books for our math circle, and actually we have all this problem to select material for our math circles. Because if you mention, uh, I remember that I mentioned that actually we have real good books, but to select it, to prepare for math circle, it takes a lot of time to do it. And we say we have math circle every Monday, and when it's done, for example, I present talk on Monday, I think, oh, all done for this week, and nothing to do. I mean, <laughs> it's most important part for me. And when <coughs> you should think about book, what we need to do in terms, in sense, of high school teachers, I think we need to write to see some book that will be aimed to high school teachers. I don't see this book, so far book, that it will be helpful to high school teachers, well written, it's some sense like calculus textbook, there's good explanation, uh, some interesting problems, and then good examples, and then maybe it will be helpful for uh, some extra book that will be explained solutions, and it will be uh, used for high school teachers for an organizing math circle. Okay, that's my comment. Well, I guess the time is up, and I extend the session. Thank you.